Thanks for joining us. I'm Steve Shu, And I'm Corey Washington, and we're your hosts for Manifold. Our guest today is the journalist and author Betsy Colbert, or Elizabeth Colbert, as she is known to most of the world. Betsy has one of the shortest Wikipedia entries I've ever seen for a famous person. Still, I know a few things about her. She is a staff writer at The New Yorker and has been since 1999. And she's the author of a number of books, including Field Notes from a Catastrophe and The Sixth Extinction, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 2015. She's the winner of numerous awards, among them two National Magazine Awards and a National Academy's Communication Award. She also lives in the oldest house at Williamston, Massachusetts, built in 1763. Welcome to Manifold, Betsy. Thanks for having me. So Betsy's one of those people for whom I can remember the exact time and place where we met. It was a cafe in Berkeley, California in 1988. Wow. I believe it was on Shattuck Street. (laughs) Um, You just started as the Albany bureau chief of the New York Times. And you'd come up to Berkeley to visit with your husband, John Kleiner, who's an old friend of mine from Amherst College. And uh, Steve, that's you asked, that's how I know Betsy. Got it. I was at that cafe in 1988. You just didn't know me then. That's, that's true. I, I, <laughs> Betsy's one of the few people who I've known longer than Steve. I think you met you and I met in 1991. Yeah, that's right. 1990. 90 or 91, um, yeah. Yeah, I just decamped. And John, you've known since since eighty one or since something. Since eighty one, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, John since was you were, one since you were born. I think. Practically, John was one of these characters on campus who he was known simply as Kleiner. You never called him by his first name; he was just Kleiner. He was famous because he uh, he re- ended up writing two theses, one in comparative literature and one in physics, and he wedded these two really disparate interests in a way that no one I've seen before or after. <laughs> So one of the great things about being near the end of the lifespan is you think you have things to tell the younger generation. This may or may not be true. But I want to ask you, looking back to being 27, 28 years old in 1988, are the things you could see in your interest back then that might have keyed you to the type of career you've come to have? So if somebody has certain thoughts in the back of their head and they're young, they may be a political reporter in Albany, but they've got some other passion percolating back. Did you have any sense that you'd move in this direction back then? Well, that's a very good question. I mean, I, as you point out, I was the Albany bureau chief in that for the Times, and that had come about, you know, pretty much by happenstance. It was always hard to know when you got an assignment at the New York Times why you had gotten it. It was sort of the wizard, you know, called you into his office and you got an assignment and. Uh, and then you were you were off within sometimes within days, you know. Um, and so I was assigned to Albany, and I stayed there for five years. And um, while I was there, I was you know I was very interested in politics. So it was a great assignment, and I wrote more I think than most people in Albany about environmental politics. I, I always I sort of always had a sort of sideline in environmental journalism. And that that would become the main line, I guess, is a little bit surprising, but on some level, not surprising. So I I think it probably happens to a lot of people that you go in one direction and there is something percolating underneath, sort of an undercurrent, and then eventually that becomes, uh, comes to the surface, as it were. I recently listened to a podcast with you and uh, Bill McKibben, is that how you pronounce his name? Yes. I think is reported... um, He's credited with writing the first popular book about climate change uh, that came out in 1989. I think it was called The End of Nature. Mm -hmm. Did Mm -hmm. you read that book? Yes, I I read it in Albany. Uh, I have a first edition of it. Uh, I went out and bought it immediately. So it was very influential to me. It was something that influenced me uh, directly. I am one of those people who became uh, aware of climate change through... Um, the efforts of uh, Jim Hansen, who's a major figure in Bill's book, um, The End of Nature, and through Bill's writing, mm-hmm. definitely. So fast forward up 30 plus years from that point in time. It's been a pretty eventful year in climate. We've just had the second hottest year on record uh, at the end of the hottest decade on record. 
Australia is burning or was burning recently with the potential extinction. I think extinct. it's still burning. Still burning. Yeah. Don't worry. Don't worry about that. <laughs> I yeah. didn't miss it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> with the potential for hundreds of species to be driven to extinction. We'll come back. This act, I think I mentioned this to you in email, but this actually sparked some thoughts I had about extinction, which are probably not profound, but I won't, that won't stop me from sharing them with you. A Swedish teenager, uh, Greta Thunberg, has been named Time's Person of the Year. So as one of the central people writing about climate these days, to reflect on the situation at the beginning of the third decade of this century, what's, a, what's at the top of your mind? Well, what's at the top of my mind is that even as I think awareness is, you know, has grown enormously, especially in the last few years and, you know, people watching pretty obviously climate related disasters. So I think that public awareness is way up and that's reflected in in opinion polls and, and things like that. But even as that has happened and there's a lot, a lot of talk and a lot of, lot of places about, you know, sustainability, and I use that word in air quotes, if you actually look at what is happening on the ground, it's pretty bad. We just hit another record in 2019 in carbon emissions. Even as we become aware of the problem, even as the problem bites more, uh, we are really not doing anything or what we are doing is not nearly sufficient to address the problem. And the problem which is really important to emphasize, I always try to emphasize it, is total emissions. It's not uh, what we put up into the air, CO2, greenhouse gases, they stay there a long time. Um, so really, it, this problem is cumulative. It just keeps adding and adding. And the more, the longer we go on, uh, and the more CO2 we put up there, the hotter the world is going to be in the end. That's just, you know, pretty basic geophysics. So what we need to be worrying about is how much we're putting up there. And even if we halved our emissions, let's say, uh, we would still get to the same place. We, it would just take us twice as long. Uh, and since we're going so fast, that wouldn't be, wouldn't, would be measured in decades. So we really need to bring our emissions down to zero. That's really the only way uh, that we're going to stabilize the climate. It's gonna be a different climate, but at least it would stabilize. What we have right now, as we keep adding CO2 to the atmosphere on a very, a very rapidly, uh, is we're going to have this constantly changing climate. Uh, we're never going to have a climate, uh, a new climate. So people, I just sorry, sorry to rattle on, but people talk often talk about this phrase, the new normal, like the fires in you know Australia, the new normal. Well, I'm sorry to say it's that's not the new normal. The new normal is going to be a constantly changing normal. So this actually leads into what I would like us to focus on. I'm a pessimist about the likelihood that humans are going to be willing to take the difficult and painful steps to lower emissions uh, for all the obvious reasons. People like to fly. We like cheap energy. Also, I think it's a little bit misleading to suggest that everyone, that we're all in this together because some places are going to experience much worse effects than others. And some are going to benefit from Some warming. are going to benefit, yeah. Um, I was le recently looking at a map of uh, likely temperature rises, and it was very low to zero in the kind of upper uh, central west, north of South Dakota. It was pretty low in Michigan. Whenever I think about these things, I think about my time at Columbia. There was a postdoc there, made a big impression on me. He was a rabid Russian nationalist. He just adored Vladimir Putin in a way that was really odd for American academics who are often politically cynical and almost never nationalistic. But his view on climate change was, uh, he believed it was a hoax. But if it wasn't a hoax, it was still okay because Russia was a cold country and it would benefit. Anything that benefited Russia was good. So I just think part of the problem is we don't suffer equally. And so many of the people putting out the biggest emissions, like countries, populations with large emissions are not uh, going to feel as much pain. So I personally don't think it's going to happen. And so I would like for part of our discussion to be focused on technological fixes for sucking carbon out of the atmosphere, because I think that's the only thing that will get carbon down. Now, I don't know. Are you cynical as I am? Well, I'm. I'm very pessimistic. Um, yes, I. I don't know if I'm as pessimistic as you are. I don't want to have. I don't want to like have a pessimistic off here, but I am very pessimistic. Perhaps I'm more pessimistic uh, 
than you are. I, this just kind of reminded me of the conversation in Dr. Strangelove. Um, but anyway, um, I think that if you look at the facts on the ground, once again, we are not doing anything. And what we would need to do is not just something, but enormous, you know, rebuilding our economy from the ground up. And I think the less pessimistic part of me says that would be a, that would be a good thing to do. That would have all sorts of good effects, but there are a lot of entrenched interests and a lot of reasons why to be skeptical about whether that's going to happen anytime in the foreseeable future. How's that? Um, so I am also pretty pessimistic. I'm, I somewhat disagree about, you know, where this is going to bite. The Australians, for example, they might not have thought that it was going to bite them in the ass, but I think now they're realizing, oh, oh, it is, you know. So I don't think that we can look around and say, oh, there are going to be places that will, um, some places may quote unquote benefit in the temporary sense, but uh, from a lot of global instability, which I think is an inevitable result of serious climate change, which we're already starting to see, um, I'm not sure any place, you know, really can say, oh, we're benefiting from that. How's that? But all that being said, we let's talk about sucking carbon out of the air. And here I will tell you the problem with that, or the difficulty, the obstacle to that, and why it also is a sort of dubious panacea, uh, is it takes a lot of energy, right? So at the point where we could produce enough energy to make an appreciable difference in the carbon in the atmosphere, from carbon-free sources, right? Because if you're just burning coal to get carbon out of the air, you know, I can assure you, you're <laughs> not gonna get a net benefit there. But let's say you suddenly, you had a surfeit of carbon-free energy. That's what people are talking about. They're saying like, one day we're gonna, we're gonna have to go carbon-free. And, and when we do that, at a certain point, we're gonna have to produce so much carbon-free energy that we can devote some of it to sucking CO2 out of the air. So that is the scenario that we're looking at. now. If, and I think, you know, there's going to be a lot of money and there's a lot of brain power that's going to be put into this because it, it's already built into a lot of the models. A lot of the models already say you've got to get CO2 out of the air. And one of the ways that they use to um, do that is a technology, an idea, it's more an idea than an te actual technology, called BEX, where, which stands for bioenergy with car carbon capture and storage. And here the idea is that you would uh, grow a forest, a fast growing, you know, kind of forest like you would for to make paper or whatever that is sucking CO2 out of the air as it grows, right? And then you burn it for energy instead of, you know, natural gas or coal or whatever, you burn wood. And then you would take that CO2 out of the flue gas, right? And you would bury it underground. And that would be a way to draw down CO2 and shove it under the ground. So that is a, if you look at any of the climate models for how to keep global temperatures below from rising more than two degrees C, they, most of them include a lot of, a lot of this technology. And there's you know, a lot of debate about whether it's really feasible or not. Are you familiar with Tim Searchinger? Mm, yes. So we had Tim on and the show. I don't show. know Tim. I don't know Tim, but I know his work. Yes. Yeah. Tim was at Amherst College uh, yep. right around my time. And he was describing a system that included two thirds of that process. Mm -hmm. You know, because the Kyoto Protocol, uh, there was a loophole that basically trees cut down here, but burned in Europe would not yeah. appear in the ledger. Right. So there, you know, Cutting down trees and burning them, not take the carbon and shoving it into the ground. But yeah, they're not uh, trapping the. They were trapping themselves. it, yeah. yeah. And so it seems like they haven't read the full memo <laughs> in this case. Right. Yes. Well, I mean, a lot of things that have been done in the name of, you know, carbon accounting, just to meet some, you know, carbon accounting rule that isn't, that aren't really, you know, solving the problem, but are just moving it around. I think that's what you're describing um, here. And that's, that's a very serious problem with, that the Europeans count, you know, bioenergy as carbon neutral. There's a lot of reasons to be skeptical about that. On the long, you know, on a very long term, that might be true, but on the human time frame, 50, 40, 50, 60 years, the next 40, 50, 60 years, which are crucial, um, it may be, you know, it's not true because it takes a long time for trees to regrow. Um, so, 
you know, that is just a, a, a numbers game. It's a game and it's, it's a lot of bad things have happened in the name of numbers games, uh, as we all know. In an article that you write about uh, carbon capture, you also talk about companies that are trying to build systems for doing this. And uh, maybe, and I don't want to review your article, but uh, can you tell us what's in it. And there's an interesting calculation in there as to how much land you might need that would line up these systems to actually make an appreciable dent. And I recall it was something on the order of the size of India. Oh, there's a lot of different techniques that people are pursuing. So one is is called direct air capture, and it is, you know, literally you can take CO2 out of the air. It's at very low um, concentrations in the air. This is, you know, one thing that carbon, climate deniers like to throw up. Oh, there's not actually that much carbon in the air. That's absolutely true. It just turns out it makes a big difference uh, at, at, at even at these very low concentrations. But it's, it's hard to get out of the air because of that, because, you know, you're, you're searching for, you know, one molecule out of every, you know, right now we're up at roughly 410 parts per million. So that's what you're looking for. And you have to, CO2 is basically um, an, an acid and you have to capture with a base. So you're using pretty, pretty well-known, um, you know, industrial processes. And as I said, the problem is they require energy. It requires energy. To, you got energy by burning this stuff and putting the CO2 out there and to get it back requires energy. So that's one technique that people are pursuing um, a lot of very smart people because as I say it's needed and when you know necessity is as we one would hope the mother of invention well here's another method that people are looking at co2 binds with certain rocks and there are big deposits of certain kinds of rocks that will react with co2 and if we could sort of bring those rocks to the surface of the earth and crunch them up uh, they might draw down a lot of co2 a fair amount of co2 so that's another technique uh, that people are looking at. And then this other technique, which we've talked about some, is, is growing trees to take up CO2 and then burning them and then taking the CO2 and burying it uh, underground. And that to do at a scale that is required uh, by some of these models. I mean, once again, we're talking in a very hypothetical zone here. That is where people cal- did the calculations and said, okay, you'd have to grow forests you know, the size of India. And, and it has a big land use component to it then. Which obviously conflicts with the need for food production. Yes. I mean, all these things are, and, and that's why some people are much more in favor of, you know, direct, it's called either direct air capture or carbon dioxide removal is, you know, you have units and I've seen these units where you are sucking CO2 out of the air. You could put them, you know, in a brownfield. You could put them anywhere. You wouldn't be taking arable land out of circulation. So fast forward up two or three decades. What do you think the situation is going to look like? Give us your, you, you traveled a lot of places when you wrote The Sixth Extinction. It was like a kind of Betsy Colbert world tour, <laughs> kind of a guided tour. Give me a sense of what you think will be happening in a couple of different areas. You spent time in uh, Central America. You spent time in Australia and Greenland. Well, I think, I mean, two or three decades is actually a really hard time to make predictions about. I mean, predictions are hard to make, especially about the future. But, um, you know, what do we know? We know that the world will be hotter. We have a fairly good reason to believe that some of the effects that were not predicted for until the middle of the century, which actually is only in 30 years from now, um, you know, that things are going to be coming at us faster and more violently than we thought. So, you know, that includes potentially sea level rise starting, you know, we're seeing accelerating sea level rise, we're seeing accelerating melt off of uh, Greenland in particular. Um, You know, if that continues and and who knows what the trajectory of that acceleration is going to be, I mean, honestly, anyone who tells you that doesn't know, no one knows. Um, So, you know, we're looking at larger and larger sea level rise, a lot of cities uh, as we, as we, discussed via email, you know, are looking at what the hell are they going to do, right? So many, many major cities in the world are right, at, basically right at sea level. This includes, you know, New York, Miami. Um, your listeners may have read recently that the government of Indonesia is hoping to move the capital from Jakarta because Jakarta is not only at sea level, it's sinking because of groundwater. 
uh, pumping. So that's, you know, that's the sort of thing that you're going to see. What are we going to do with these major, major cities uh, that are going to be increasingly vulnerable to sea level rise? Then, you know, then the biggie or a biggie, one biggie that stands out there is, is water shortages. I mean, what are we going to do? What the fires in Australia, um, you know, before they had fire, they had drought. They have a terror. They're in a terrible drought. I was actually just recently in Australia, and people were saying all over the place, different parts of the country, if only we got some rain. Uh, towns are, were running out of water. Uh, farmers were running out of water, selling off their livestock because uh, they just couldn't keep them going. So that's a huge, going to be a huge, huge issue. It's going to be you know, a huge issue in developed countries like Australia, and it's going to be potentially an even huger issue in developing countries uh, where they don't necessarily have the same kind of water infrastructure. So that is one thing that I would be uh, looking at very carefully. Are we going to start to see more and more water stress and how uh, are people going to respond to that? I think that's a very scary unknown. So this was an issue that people brought up, I think, beginning about two decades ago. There were forecasts about increasing conflicts over water. I don't know if you remember, there was a whole discussion of, of when we would start having wars over water. Yeah. And um, you know, I'm not really sure where that discussion went, but it, it didn't seem to, at least I couldn't see that many conflicts that were obviously about water happening. But it appears that it may not drive conflicts between countries, but it may put stress on individual countries' infrastructures. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know that we do have good, you know, data on that as it were because you know how would you how on one hand it's just hard to decide what started a conflict but you know people have looked at the war in syria and it's very debated i don't i don't want to say that this is you know sort of fixed science but there was a there was a very serious drought leading up to the war and a lot of people were pushed into the city from the countryside farmers you know villagers were pushed into big cities and there's a certain amount of evidence that that was a stressor that helped provoke the Civil War. Now, I think it's very difficult to tease those things out. And it also is possible, as you say, that you know, countries don't go to war over water, but people who don't have enough water you know, can't survive. It's as simple as that. <laughs> so you know, what is gonna happen uh, as already uh, fragile parts of the world experience greater water stress? I don't think that's something that we know the answer to, you know, maybe maybe you could say, well, it, you know, it brings people together. They've got to all figure out a way to get, you know, get water infrastructure, the water infrastructure uh, in there. But I think that one has the unhappy feeling uh, that perhaps that's not the case. That perhaps it will lead to either internal uh, struggle, internal migration that then provokes, you know, crises. So I, it's very hard to to say. You know, my first uh, awareness of a conflict over water was actually in California. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion among people about how much water was getting sent to L.A. or the Central Valley. And, of course, because Californians are very civilized, you know, it never got into fisticuffs. But there was, there's definitely a lot of conflict going back three or four decades in California over this topic. When you, were in, when you and I were in California, Corey, there was a lot of controversy over the Hetch Hetchy Reservoir. Do you remember this? Which is up in the Sierras. And um, the idea, Betsy, I don't know if you remember this, but they uh, were going to dam up uh, this river up in this valley and fill the valley and make a red giant reservoir, which is basically why Northern California has no water problems right now, because they did it. And at the time, everybody said, well, you're going to remove this uh, suddenly this one valley, which no one had ever heard of before, um, became like an uber important environmental cause because obviously I'm sure there's some unique species that we just lost. But but now nobody, basically nobody, as far as I can tell, remembers that controversy, which was in all the papers when you and I were in school. Um, now they just have good water supply. And uh, so there's a big, you know, there's a big reservoir there where that valley was. Um, well, the Hetch Hetchy is very old. The Hetch Hetchy dates to the beginning. It's probably at least a century old. So I'm, I'm not sure why it was in the news when you guys were there, because it had been in place already for, you know, 60, 70 years by the time you guys got there. But there are a lot of people who'd like to undam it. It was supposedly one of the most beautiful. It was another Yosemite. 
so it's 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 sort of as if you were sitting now. Let's let's just dam up Yosemite and 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 put a reservoir there. So um, there's still a lot of people who feel that the Hetch Hetchy never should have been dammed, uh, and who would like to see it undammed. But as as you're suggesting, you know that ain't happening anytime soon. You know, again, it's a pessimist, right? I think you really got to just focus on these kinds of solutions, and they're often going to have obviously down, obvious downsides. They may help mitigate climate rise, but if you look around the, the globe, right, a lot of coastal cities are threatened. And you wrote an article about Miami, and it seems pretty clear to me that people are not going to move out of Miami en masse. It's just too nice a place to live. And so Miami's going to have to change, and it's going to change probably in the same way that New York is going to change. You're going to be building extra land, perhaps, to protect existing residential areas. Uh, New York is planning to add two blocks to the east of uh, the southern part of Manhattan, in addition to seawalls. Uh, and my impression is a lot of people who are climate activists see talk of this kind of thing as a kind of moral hazard. If you acknowledge that you've got to suck carbon out of the air, you've got to build seawalls, you're taking pressure off from the desire to reduce emissions. But it just seems like this is, given human nature, and given the fact that people don't respond unless there's a catastrophe right at their doorstep, it's where a lot of energy should be placed. Well, I think that um, there's there's a lot to unpack in what you just said, so let me try. So one, one point to make is, just starting with Miami, Miami has a unique, almost unique problem. It's, it's built on limestone, so New York is built on bedrock, um, and there it's con it is conceivable and much debated, I want to say, New York's plan to sort of extend, you know, lower Manhattan and, you know, build up lower Manhattan so that we don't lose, you know, Wall Street and things like that. I, I don't know. That That is in its early phase stages and nothing, no, no ground has been broken, you know. So, you know, that whether that is really a viable plan or not, um, I, I don't know. I can't comment on that. But for Miami, they have a particular problem because if you put up a seawall and you have this sort of spongy stuff underneath, the water just comes underneath. So they cannot put up seawalls. And I think everyone there, every civil engineer would tell you that. That's not a viable alternative for Miami. So what Miami is going to do, well, I certainly agree with you that there will be every effort made you know, to preserve Miami because people live there and they love it and there's a huge economy there. Uh, whether it is physically possible or not, I mean, there are certain you know, problems that just even the cl most clever engineering can't solve. And, and Miami is is potentially one of those. So we're going to see. But I think that the moral hazard of adaptation versus, you know, mitigation, reducing emissions, that debate, I think, uh, is kind of over. And I think anyone you talk to, virtually anyone you talk to who's really in this world will say, well, obviously, we're going to have to do both. And the reason that we have to do both is, you know, there's a lot of stuff built in, we're not avoiding it, we're not avoiding a lot of sea level rise at this point. And you know, anyone who's at all realistic will tell you that. But the reason why the you can't do one and not the other is because, let's say for a moment that New York's plan is viable up to X amount of sea level rise, two feet, whatever it is, uh, three feet. If you keep pouring CO2 into the air, you are going to exceed that, you know, very rapidly, right? So you have to, uh, there's no, there's no plan that can deal with unlimited climate change. It simply is not possible. And if you look at how much ice there is, you know, still locked up in Greenland and Antarctica, uh, it's, uh, you know, dozens and dozens of feet of sea level rise. So we can't just um, adapt our way out of this without also uh, reducing our emissions. I, I think if we, you know, if you, actually blow through all the carbon that we have stored underground, you know, people have done, uh, you know, in fossil fuels, people have done calculations, you know, you will, you will melt all of Antarctica, you will have, you know, vast tracts of the earth underwater at that point. So these things have to be done sort of in, in concert, because otherwise you're adapting to this constantly changing environment, which is very, very hard for any major city to do if you have an infrastructure 
plan that takes 20, 30 years to implement. And by the time you're done, it's been, it's obsolete already. That's obviously a, a recipe for disaster. So one of Steve and my, my obsessions is with uncertainty. And in many ways, science is an attempt to characterize uncertainty uh, and to try to draw some conclusions, even though it's out there. So climate science is hard. It's non-experimental. You don't, you don't bring in a population of rats and run intervention and then try to generalize that to people with a similar intervention. It, it strikes me it's a little like cosmology. It's a very observational. You make inferences about the future from the past. So there's a lot of uncertainty in uh, climate models. And so I'm curious as to how you try to approach that. I mean, clim climate science is almost uh, the nexus of a perfect storm epistemologically. It's very political. It's very uncertain. And you're supposed to base public policy on this. So how do you try to approach it given essentially those three constraints? I'm not sure they're quite constraints, but I think you see what I'm talking about. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's very uncertain timing-wise. You know, it's very uncertain where certain thresholds are. Absolutely, those things are very uncertain, but certain things are actually very robust about climate science. You know, so it's very robust that, you know, you're you trap more, you know, you have pour more CO2 into the air, you get out a certain temperature increase at the end. There's an, uns you know, there's a range of possibilities, um, but, you know, those are very robust. Okay. So that's one, you know, you, you raise the temperature of the earth, uh, you are going to reduce it, you know, you're going to melt a lot of ice. That's extremely robust as well, right? Uh, warm air holds more moisture. Uh, you're going to get more evaporation. You're going to get more water stress, and you're also going to get more flooding. Th those are also very robust predictions. So then, you, then the granular stuff of that. Okay, exactly. Where is that rain going to fall? Where is that hurricane going to make landfall? All that. That is very difficult, and people are, you know, willing to roll the dice to a certain extent. But I think that I, when I write about climate change, I I'm pretty conservative, you know, I don't give you the most out there, you know, possibilities, but as I say, a lot of it is within a band of uncertainty. It's, it's as robust as, you know, it's, 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 it's basic geoscience. It's not like, it, I guess I would push back and say it isn't really, you know, it, it ain't rocket science. I mean, it is actually pretty basic geophysics, which has been understood. The first calculations of what would happen if you, a lot of CO2 into the air were done by Svante Arrhenius back in the 1890s, and they were actually pretty good calculations. I, I have to now interject and reveal my, as the uh, online people say, reveal my power level being a physicist and having looked carefully at this uh, in recent years. There is a well-understood effect, which is the absorption of CO2 uh, in the atmosphere. It's confined to a relatively small wavelength band. And the effect is logarithmic. So a doubling of CO2 density in the atmosphere causes an equivalent shift uh, in the temperature. And so that aspect of it is un well understood, but that only accounts for about one degree Celsius in, uh, say, one degree Celsius per doubling of CO2. And the really dramatic effects come from second-order effects, like, for example, changing the amount of cloud cover, um, the distribution of moisture in the atmosphere, and things like that. And those are subject to pretty significant modeling uh, uncertainties. And so I believe if you look at the most, maybe, maybe I've not looked at the most recent one, but the next to most recent IPCC report still, still has a range of like one and a half degrees Celsius to maybe three or four degrees Celsius per doubling of CO2 dense in the yes. atmosphere. So it's pr a pretty extensive range. And some critics would even say the range could be even larger than what these guys say. But if I stay sort of toward the like uh, low end of their range, then you can talk about a scenario where, you know, uh, we do get some climate change, maybe in our lifetimes, it, it isn't even the catastrophic stuff yet. It's just kind of still linear, slight increase uh, year by year, two millimeters, I think of sea level rise is what they measure, uh, at least recently, and it seems to be still kind of linear. So I, I I wouldn't discount the tail risk that we encounter some really catastrophic stuff, but it could actually happen after, you know, like Corey, Corey and I are in our 50s. So it potentially could happen after you and I are very alert, 
you know what I'm saying? It could be toward the end of our lives or after our lives are over. So um, I don't know. There's, there's just a tremendous amount of uncertainty in what's really going to happen. Well, I mean, to, 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 you know, obviously you're right. There's a big uncertainty range, you know, in the, you know, doubled CO2, what is the climate sensitivity? But I, I do want to say at this point, we have already have observed temperature increase of, you know, one degree C. So the idea that it's going to be, it's going to happen to be at the low end of that sensitivity. I don't think many um, people in the climate world anymore would say, I th- they think that's very likely because of what we are seeing, you know, empirically out there already. Um, but if you look in sort of the mid range of those, you know, of that uncertainty, um, you know, it doesn't sound like much, right? So, you know, two degrees or whatever, that doesn't sound like much. But once again, if you look at empirical experience, okay, Australia's on fire, <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it turns out that our intuitive sense, and, you know, as a physicist, you would have obviously a way better sense of this than I, our intuitive sense of what that means and what it actually means on the ground. And it will be very patchy. I mean, as, as, as Corey was suggesting, it won't be, and as you were suggesting, it won't be universally true, you know, that everyone will, will suffer the same. But the unpredictable effects of climate change, I think, are what, you know, this is, it's, 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 it's almost like a koan, but it's, you know, it's the, it's the unknown unknowns that I think, to me, are really the most worrisome. Um, we keep seeing effects that we did not anticipate. Oh, we didn't expect that one. You know, that was something that we just didn't expect. We, and that is true because of the interaction of the climate and biology. And that's what gets really, really complicated. And in my view, pretty scary. The, the interaction of climate and biology and the interaction of climate and human humanity has that uh, socio, you know, uh, socioeconomics. Um, there's a lot of unknowns there. And to uh, imagine that they're all going to fall the right way, that takes a level of optimism that, to be honest, I don't have. You know, many people are on some level betting with their feet, as it were, but it's hard for me to sign on to that, you know, just say, okay, yeah, what, what are the odds of all those things falling, you know, the way in the best way. I don't think they're very high. So um, I, I haven't read this whole, the recent report, but I just pulled it up uh, online. This is the 2019 IPCC report in concordance with what you said, Betsy. So they say one degree of global warming Celsius, uh, degree of global warming above pre-industrial levels has already been observed. Um, error bar on that is about 0.2 degrees Celsius. So it's, it is pretty close to one degree Celsius. And then their projection, they say global warming is likely to reach 1.5 degrees Celsius between 2030 and 2052. You and I are going to be pretty old in 2052. Uh, if it continues to increase at the current rate, and then they say high, that's a high confidence prediction. So with high confidence in the time range, 2030 to 2052, 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that's what we're going to, I mean, again, they could be 100% wrong in either direction, honestly, in my opinion. But if I just accept their high confidence range, um, during the rest of our lifetimes, our you know, good brain functioning part of our lives, uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius is what we're talking about, maybe two degrees Celsius, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. One of the, one of the reasons why this is, it, is really an tractable problem, you could argue, is because it has a big time lag. There's a big time lag in the system. So by the time we've guaranteed 1.5 degrees, which is, you know, basically now, you know, right now, right. Uh, you know, you and I can sit here and say, you could say, you know, I, you know, we're in our 50s, we're not going to really suffer the worst of that. And that's absolutely true. But and that's why, you know, Greta you know, Thunberg is out there saying, we are going to suffer that uh, and get your act together. And I have a lot of sympathy um, for her and for that, uh, for the youth of the world. And I, when I go talk at colleges, I always say to young people, yeah, I am not going to suffer the worst of it. Uh, and you may not suffer the worst of it, you know, but you will be looking at a future that's severely constrained. Uh, by this and you should be pissed and you should be getting pissed at people like us you know who are not uh, taking the responsible actions to secure you know a better future for you and I I think that is that going to be the next huge generational divide you know I don't know but it should be by the way just to clarify I don't know if I read this part so the the 1.5 degrees Celsius high confidence 
we'll reach that uh, between 2030 and 2052. That's assuming we continue to increase uh, carbon CO2 levels at the current rate. So, yes, which so, I think is a pretty yeah. safe bet between yeah. now and 2030, which is only 10 years away. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, there's a big, there's a big, um, there's a big intergenerational justice issue here. Very big. So let me, since I, I'm also kind of a pessimist in the ability of human societies to look far ahead and make decisions for future generations that might cost uh, the existing uh, adults uh, a lot of pain. So I agree with you about pessimism in that way. Or but, at the very least, their vacations. Yeah, yeah, uh, convenience. Uh, but l- let me give you a not completely crazy. So within these IPCC parameters, let me give you what I think is a not entirely crazy scenario, which isn't that negative. Okay, so we do hit this 1.5 C increase sometime between 2030 and 2050. But for example, better and better solar technology. Now we are getting pretty good. So the kilowatt per kilowatt hour cost of solar is getting down quite a bit. Um, very competitive. And what's lagging is battery technology, because obviously if you collect a lot of solar power during the day, what are you going to do during the night? You need some way to store it. But there's a decent chance in the next 10, 20 years, which is what we're talking about here, battery technology improves dramatically. And then maybe we can bend the carbon curve down from where we are today. And maybe by that time, there will be some sea level rise, there will be some extreme weather nastiness, et cetera, but not world-ending catastrophic stuff, some negative climate stuff, which I think will steal the will of people to implement, okay, we're going to push out charging stations and electric car, you know, faster. Uh, but the world avoids complete meltdown. In other words, you know, their technology is going to help us. Uh, there's going to be some warming, but 20 years from now, people are taking it pretty seriously, and we have qualitatively better technologies to generate power without carbon. Um, is that is that impossible? Is that not going to no, happen? No, not, not yeah. at all. I think yeah. that's uh, I think that's quite plausible, actually. I, I, I'm actually not convinced that you're going to get utter chaos with a 1.5 or two degree right. C rise. I think it's quite possible human societies may adapt in really surprising ways. Uh, I think Canada will become much more populous over time. I think Arizona may cease to be the destination of people leaving the Northeast. I don't know if you saw the article in the Times recently, but um, Many people in Phoenix becoming nocturnal because it's just so hot during the day. Yeah, I think that you that you may you know that you may be well be right, and may, you know may, there's there's a more optimistic way to look. And humans are very adaptable um, and very clever, absolutely. And that's why you know there are almost eight billion of us on the planet, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I think some people are going to be screwed. Let me say that flat out, right? People in like you know South Asia, Africa. There's going to be massive inequities in how, and there already are, and how people are going to be affected by this. Yeah, I, I think, I think this, if say two degrees is baked in by the end of our lives, yeah, there are going to be a billion, maybe multi billions of poor people in the global south that are going to suffer a lot, right? There's probably. But I, I also want to want to make the point, and I, I do think we're seeing this already with, mini, you know just the beginnings of climate disruption, but simply because the world is globalized, uh, people are on the move. They're on the move for all sorts of reasons. And we don't react very well to that. Uh, you know, you might've noticed that there's, you know, a wall going up on the Southern border. So, you know, this idea that Canada will become, you know, a better place and everyone will move there and what's the big deal. That's nice on some theoretical level, but I don't see it on a practical level. And so I think that those dislocations, that's exactly what worries me. What happens when, you know, a billion people are on the move? Yeah, I think we've probably seen it even in more radical form in uh, in Europe. People leaving Africa, trying to get to Europe. Yeah, I, yeah. I would almost say that, you know, so in this mild, maybe you would say somewhat optimistic view of what might happen with climate, it could be that the amount of migration pressure on Europe is actually greater just due to high birth rates right now in Africa. Because if you just look at the birth rates in Africa, they're, they're going to be an extra billion Africans, and they're going to want to... It's quite close to Europe, right? If you look at the map, they can, you know, they just need to get across the Mediterranean. So I, I think migration as pressure on developed societies is not going to go away for sure. But it may not... Climate may not be the biggest driver of it. Actually, it could be population, just population demographics. Yeah, I expect both will be forces yes. because a lot of this farmland in Africa is going to yeah. become unviable. It's it's borderline unviable now. Well, I so I don't 
I, again, I'm not a real expert on climate, but I seem to recall the statement that the, the effects were least around the equator, actually. Like the heating is mainly concentrated uh, furthest away from the equator. No, it was really, really spotty. The map I saw showed lots of warming I, in, in around Africa. We yeah. can look at it again. Yeah, I, I as dubious as I am about the actual point estimates for average global temperature increase, any geographical stuff I'm 100% dubious of that they can forecast. Right. This, this I think, is, is even more... more relevant on some level when it comes to agriculture is precipitation. And that is really hard to, that is really hard to predict. I think people would probably say the modeling is, you know, getting better, but is it the absolute temperature or, you know, as we've seen in Australia to a certain extent, is it not getting any rain, you know? So far, this conversation has been very anthropocentric, Mm -hmm. focusing almost exclusively on us. Um, And the sixth extinction is really about non-human animals and the effects of climate change on them. I'm just curious, you profile a range of scientists looking at a range of species there. Have you stayed in touch with them since then? Have you heard reports on how some of these species are faring and what they might be doing to protect them? Um, I've stayed in touch with some of them, definitely. And, you know, the scary thing about the book is um, that everything, you know, that people were worried about has um, come true. It's once again, one of those things where, you know, even faster than you thought. Um, So for example, there's a chapter out of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, The Great Barrier Reef bleached really badly in 2016, 2017. So big stretches of the reef were very severely affected. Uh, You know, dead, dying, so that's something that people said, you know, once again, that's something people were saying, oh, we're going to see, in a, in, you know, if we keep going at this rate, we'll see this in a few decades. And then they were hit with it um, way sooner than, than people, people thought they were going to see it. So that's something that has happened faster and more furiously. In the book, I talk about the Sumatran rhino, uh, efforts to save the Sumatran rhino, which it was, is a species that was seemed at that point to be down to 200 individuals. I think now people would say it's down to 100 individuals. It's been a real uh, catastrophe. And I think that the odds of that species are really, really magnificent species, you know, making it through this century, making to the middle of the century uh, are not great at this point. So that's something that's very sad. What else is, <laughs> what other species do I talk about? In the book? I mean, there's been a lot of bad news lately. You know, insects are collapsing. Birds are, in North America, we just got a report that the number of birds in North America have fallen by a quarter um, over the last few decades. So, you know, there's a lot of really mega bad news about other, other species that keeps uh, hitting us. As far as I understand, some of the theories on insect collapse are that they're due to land use changes and pesticides in part. So it seems like it's a combination of, of factors. Uh, I'm not sure if you know this, but I was really curious about whether there have been aggressive efforts to preserve some of these species uh, essentially in the freezer, right? storing DNA, storing cell lines in the, D- in the freezer of the laboratory, because it seems like it's probably not too far away when we'll have the technology to bring back some of these species, whether by cloning them and transplanting uh, the, you know, fabricated uh, gametes into, you know, other hosts, um, or, you know, maybe some kind of artificial preserve. Was there any discussion of that? Oh, yeah, there's a big, um, at, at, in San Diego, there's, there's something called the frozen zoo. They're trying to collect DNA tissue. Now, I, it's actually a really interesting question whether they have insects. I don't know what their preservation techniques are for insects, but they certainly have I know they have a lot of birds and mammalian tissue, uh, amphibian tissue, reptile. Um, so yeah, people are out there trying to freeze, you know, as much as much as they can. Yeah, they they would not necessarily say, you know, for resurrection purposes, but as as things become rare, you know, you might want to go back and look and see what genetics you're missing that you used to have. So there's a lot of work being done on that. For example, let's go see, even in museum samples, can we see, you know, if we're, where we've lost diversity in the genome, things like that. Yeah. 
as I was reading The Sixth Extinction, I realized there was a collision between a couple different priorities in the world. One is preserving these species. The other is the fight against invasive species. I think at some point you say that these species have to move north at about 30 miles a year to survive, which yeah. makes them, by definition, an invasive species in some area. But that's how they're going to survive. And so it just occurred to me that we might want to encourage a certain amount of invasion if the risk is that you're going to lose a megafauna, right? You don't want to do this for everything, but a megafauna at some point. We have to just drop some of our principles. I do want to say, I don't think that people consider, if, if, if you used to occupy a contiguous territory and you're on the move owing to climate change, I, I'm not sure anyone would, I, I, I don't know what the defi definition of invasive is, but I'm not, I don't, I think it's rare that people, people would consider that a rain shift. Invasives tend to be things that have moved across, you know, entire oceans, entire continents, or two continents. You know? And I think that, you know, I don't want to say there aren't, isn't a big gray area there, but a rain shift versus a, you know, you got transported across a continent, across a water body. Those are usually pretty easy to, pretty easy for the big invasive species. You know, they're like the hundred top worst invasive species in the world. Those are, very clearly things that humans moved around on ships, usually uh, very long distances. They came to a place they had no predators, right? That's a big part of being a very successful invader. You are completely out of, you have, you've, you, you, you've lost your predators, you left them 5,000 miles behind and your diseases and your pathogens. So if I'm just doing a rain shift, right? My pathogens are coming with me, quite possibly my predators are coming with me. So it has a very different biological uh, I, I'm carrying with me a whole suite of things that, that are likely to keep my population in control and why invaders are so, can be, can grow explosively is because they leave all that behind. Is there any thought to have controlled rain shifts for populations that are facing temperatures? Yes, that are absolutely. Absolutely. People are, talk, people talk about this, um, you know, should you have these pl planned translocations uh, get things, you know, move things with the climate because another thing that's happening and much more, to be honest, concerning than are things going to shift their ranges and be considered invasive is are things not going to be able to shift their range because there's a shopping mall in, in there because there's New York City sitting in the way, LA is sitting in the way. So what are you going to do if you need to shift your range but you can't? So should humans be basically, you know, lift airlifting you across that? that obstacle. Yeah, that's that's going to be a big topic of conversation. I think, you know, people have been kind of opposed to it saying, well, you know, how do we know where exactly to move things, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, but, but yes, that's definitely a conversation. Can we uh, think of any plausible way that the world gets organized in the next decade or two to actually fight climate change? I mean, I just read something saying that the outcome of the Paris Accords uh, on climate change basically had no effect whatsoever on the rate of warming that uh, was basically negligible. So can, can we imagine a kind of collective action that will actually fix things, make a difference? Well, I mean, I think we can imagine it, you know, absolutely. If you have a good imagination, you can imagine anything. How about pl a pl something Corey would find plausible? <laughs> that Corey would find plausible. Um, it's hard. It's damn hard. I mean, right now you have you know, if we had a different group of people in the White House, um, maybe, and, you know, it would be possible. How's that? Because I think that the U.S. the U.S. is still the world's largest cumulative um, emitter, though it is no longer the largest emitter on an annual basis. Uh, China is. But the leadership of the U.S. and the leadership of China, they can determine the outcome uh, for everybody else, basically. And our leadership, as I don't need to tell, to review is you know grim I, you know we the, the trump administration has petitioned to withdraw from paris which it cannot do technically until after the next election so we'll see what happens but in addition to that they have just and i think one of the you know of all the many many terrible things they've done they've tried to unravel literally you know i shouldn't say literally they've tried to unravel every action the obama administration took to try to re reduce emissions and then they've kept going. I mean, they're now attacking laws that have been on the books. Um, NEPA, 
is a big, is, was, was sort of the first big environmental, one of the first big environmental review laws uh, enacted in 1970. They're trying to... What did it uh, state? Uh, NEPA requires environmental review for big projects. So it's all, if you're putting in a pipeline, you're, you know, all, all big infrastructure projects have to go through this environmental review process. It can take years and it really slows things down. And of course, you know, pipeline developers hate it, et cetera. But um, it's import, really important for um, community input, all of those uh, things that, and, and for slowing down and potentially stopping projects that shouldn't be built. Uh, and the Trump administration, this has been on the books, as I say, since 1970, and the regs have not been changed very much since 1970. But lo and behold, the Trump administration is trying to just basically, you know, rewrite the regs, uh, unclear if that's legal or not, and uh, to in favor of the developers of largely fossil fuel infrastructure, the last thing that we need to be doing, building more fossil fuel infrastructure. I think we can all agree on that. Whatever, you know, whether you think this problem is manageable or you think it's not manageable, um, building more for fossil fuel infrastructure is, is, is not the right thing to be doing right now. Yeah, this is something that's been really striking, if, as you must be fully aware, the fact that the U.S. has come to produce so much energy from natural gas has become incredibly attractive. Uh, I mean, and it, oil, and oil, and yeah, oil. and it's very difficult, right? Because it's a boon for us economically, and it's extremely hard to imagine us turning off that money spigot. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I'm not really aware of countries foregoing such large segments of their econo economy. Uh, willfully, it's uh, it's just too attractive. Well, I think one example is Germany actually is paying tremendously high prices for their electricity because they have implemented solar and alternative methods for producing that electricity. So they are paying they are paying an economic price for it, and they're doing it. So and they've created a market for solar panels and things like that. So um, that's a positive example. That's true, and they have a lot of really dirty coal that they are not using. So yes. There's one example. We can come up with one. Yeah, so it's possible. But could I like can you come up with a scenario like that you would believe that say 10, 15 years from now the whole world kind of becomes like Germany or I, I can imagine it if solar prices continue to go come down and battery technology gets really good, then no brainer, right? You just kind of switch over and um, that's the most positive thing I can come up with. <laughs> it's effectively what happened to coal in some sense. Natural gas got so cheap that people began to move away from coal and yeah, if there's a similar scenario with solar, then I can imagine it happening. I mean, the Chinese government is, because they have you know control of their economy, they're single-handedly solving the chicken and egg problem by just putting in massive numbers of charging stations all over the country and giving huge rebates for people who buy electric cars. So they are going to create that ecosystem basically by force, which Western governments can't do. So you know that, that will help, I think. But as we talked about in our podcast of Bruno Messias, they're also offshoring their energy production via coal to Pakistan. So they're kind of playing both hands, um, playing the clean hand in China and the dirty hand sure. uh, in Pakistan. That's how the incentives work, right? Yeah. it's um, Yeah. So Betsy, I don't want to keep it for too long, but I want to contemplate another uh, very dire, dark possibility. You've written about both AI and climate change. And you're familiar with the concept of the singularity. Yep. And so... I want to know, what do you see as a greater threat to humanity over the next 100 years? Runaway AI technology or runaway climate change? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm going to go with, uh, I'm, I'm, st I'm sticking with climate change. Uh, I'm, I, I, you know, dance with the one who brought you. Um, <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to stick with, with climate change, but I do, one thing that I think that, you know, and I'm by no, no expert on AI, and I'm but I think that AI is going to radically change once again in a, in a social sense, you know, a sense of uh, even if, if you know, long before we get to the singularity, no, you know, no one's going to have a job um, and that's already happening. So we're, you know, we're going to see the hollowing out of our economy and people keep scratching their heads about, you know, why do we have such a strong economy and wage growth is so bad? And, you know, I'm no economist, but I would strongly suspect that you know, automation and AI play a big role in that, right? Because you don't, you just don't need any people anymore. Um, and so, 
you know, the combination of a lot of social change in a very small amount of time combined with climate change, you know, you could say, you could argue, and I think it's a good argument, and I'll make it, and this is the argument, you know, that people make for things like the Green New Deal. There's a huge infrastructure project to be, um, to be many infrastructure projects to be built to, to alter our economy, it would be good for our economy, it would give people jobs, uh, you know, up and down the pay scale all over the country. Uh, and that would be a very, very positive thing, you know, both in terms of climate change and in terms of, you know, the job market. That, that's a, you know, win-win has that potential way out of this. And then another one, just last point I will leave, leave you with too, is one of the reasons that people, you know, economists would say, okay, we're always going to be uh, leaning towards adaptation measures as opposed to reducing our emission measures is because those dollars too are spent locally and create jobs locally, right? So if I'm going to put a seawall around Manhattan, that's a huge number of construction jobs. A lot of people will get behind that. Whereas if I say, okay, everyone in New York, let's have our emissions, uh, not a lot of people are going to get behind that. So you can see there's an asymmetry there. And I think there's also a clear asymmetry of the sort we already talked about, which is AI is hollowing out of the uh, employment landscape is going to be very, very selective. And as a result, I think a lot of people who are fairly affluent and have jobs that are hard to automate are obviously not going to see a great risk. Yeah, but I think, um, I mean, I, I read a very compelling study, I think it was out of MIT, about, you know, they divided jobs into four quadrants, and one was, uh, and they were all a matter of re re repetition, how repetitive things were. And there are a lot of white collar jobs. They're not necessarily, you know, they're not like CEO, but they're, they're, you know, they're billing, they're accounting, they're those sorts of things. And you can see it in your own life. You know, the people that you used to deal with in your bank or whatever, who are not there anymore because you don't need any people. <laughs> um, so those are, those are not, I agree, those are not top 1% jobs, but they're a big quadrant of white collar jobs that are that are in danger. And then the other jobs that are very hard to automate are very at the bottom of the pay scale, right? They're people who are, you know, home healthcare workers and things like that. That that's very hard to automate. So that so these these MIT guys were saying they're gonna be, you know, these two kinds of jobs. One, white collar, the very creative jobs that can't be, that aren't repetitious, and the very hard to automate because they're just so, you know in someone's home, that sort of thing. They're very, very hard to automate as well. Yeah. I mean, at the high end, you could have radiologists, for example, that are put out of work by Yes. AI. Absolutely. That's already happening. Yeah. yeah. AI is really yeah. successful there. Maybe not most GPs. And even like with telesurgery and things like that, you could have, or I don't know, you could have a robot that's really good at just closing, right? So the surgeon goes away and it closes. So who knows? Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Betsy. This has been a really really pleasurable conversation. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you both. It was fun.